Hello everyone, my name is Jason Gregerson, and this is going to be the video key for the practice final exam. So we're going to start off with page one. We're given a couple of matrices here and asked to do some operations. So we will just take a look at the first couple. So the first one says, looking at the 2, 1 component of the matrix A. So 2, 1 means look at the second row, first column. That gives us a value of 0. B says we're going to take the product A times B. So I'm going to write out that product over here. I have my first my first matrix times my second matrix and then I'll write out the result here first I can note that this is a 3 by 2 times a 2 by 2 so the result I expect to get is going to be a 3 by 2 so I'll start off by putting the values of the first column of this product this looks like it's going to be 0 minus 6 and then I will have 0 minus 3 and 1 plus 0 uh, the next column is going to look like 0 plus 2, 0 plus 1, and 2 plus 0. So the result here looks to be negative 6, negative 3, 1, and 2, 1, 2. And so that should be my product of A and B. C says the dimensions of A, so we kind of just covered that, right? That's a 3 by 2 matrix. And D says B inverse, so it is a 2 by 2 matrix, so let's check to see if it is invertible. We have a formula for the inverse of a 2 by 2. It looks like 1 over the determinant, and the determinant is this product, which is negative 1, minus this product, so negative 1 minus 6. So we have that number times the matrix where we take our matrix B, and we switch the values on the strong diagonal, so I'm actually moving this negative 1 over to this position, and then I also put negative signs on the off diagonal. And so if I can simplify that if I want, or I can just leave it like that. This would be a negative 1 7th times the matrix, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and 1. So that would be my inverse. And of course, on an exam, I could always check to see if that value was correct by just taking that and multiplying it by b on either side, and I should get to the identity matrix. All right, so that was question number one. Question number two says, for each of these row reduced augmented matrices, and those are some important pieces here. One, I'm being told that they're already row reduced, so I don't have to do any of that kind of legwork to find out about the solutions. And also, these are augmented matrices, so these are really giving me that full system of equations with the coefficient matrix and then that right-hand side over here. <coughs> All right, so I want to give the solutions to the system in parametric vector form, and then describe the solution set as either a single point, a line in R3, a plane in R3, or no solution. So I'll look at the first one. So the first one, I see that uh, that last row is all zeros, and so that means that there are going to be solutions. I don't have any conflicts here with this last equation. It looks like I have two pivot positions, and I have one column without a pivot position, so it looks like I'm going to have a free variable, so I'm expecting to get infinitely many solutions here. Now let's actually write out what these solutions would be. Well, I'm just going to go back from this row reduced augmented matrix back to the equation form of the system. So if I look at the equation associated with that first row, I should get x1 plus 2x3 equals 3. My second equation is going to give me x2 plus x3 equals 4. I don't have a third equation here, and partly because x3 is just going to be a free variable. So I'm just going to write x3 equals x3. And now my solution is just some vector that has an x1, x2, and x3 component. And me solving these equations I just wrote are me trying to find that x1, x2, and x3 value. So in this case, x3 is going to be my free variable. I'm going to solve the other two variables in terms of that free variable. So what is x1? Well, this equation tells me that x1 is just 3 minus 2x3. What is x2? Well, this equation just tells me that x2 is 4 minus x3. So this is my solution. But now I want to clean it up a little bit, write it in parametric form. That is just in terms of the free variables. So really, the only thing I'll modify a little bit is I'm going to write that last component here, x3, as 0 plus x3. That really helps me see um, the scalar values here, that's 3, 4, and 0, and then the coefficients of my free variable. So now I'm just going to write this as the sum of two variables. I'm just going to write this as the sum of two vectors. The vector 3, 4, 0 
plus x3 times the vector negative 2, negative 1, and 1. We can see these, this vector is just gathering up all those coefficients of the x3 free variable. <clears throat> so this would be my solution in parametric vector form. Now this is a, a function in R3 and it has, has one independent variable. X3 here is my free variable. So this is going to represent a line in R3. One way I can visualize that is if I have some vector 3, 4, and I add some other vector, but not just any vector, any multiple of this vector, I can see I'm really just tracing out this line from some starting point. All right, let's look at the next one. First, I'll give myself a little bit of room here by taking this solution just moving it down. And I'll look at the next one. So in this case, I see that I have pivot positions in each of the columns of the coefficient matrix. And so that tells me there should be a unique solution to this system, one and only solution. In fact, if I write out the equations, I can see the solutions directly. x1 equals 2, x2 equals negative 3, and x3 equals 0. So those are the values for x1, x2, and x3 that satisfy this system of equations. And those are the only values. There are no free variables, so this point is my only solution. So my solution is just the point 2, negative 3, 0. This is a single point in R3. All right, now I go to the last one. Here I see I have one pivot position and two columns without pivot positions. So I'm expecting to get two free variables um, when I solve this system. Once again, I look at the, both of those rows of all zero, and I don't have a pivot position in my far right-hand column, so I know this is consistent, has free variables, so there are infinitely many solutions. But not only that, right away I can see that because there's two free variables, the representation for this solution set will be a plane, a plane in R3. Now let's see what the solutions look like. Well, really, I only have one equation to take values from. I have x1 plus 4x2 minus 2x3 equals 1. And the other two equations are just 0 equals 0, essentially. And the reason I have those other equations there is because x2 is a free variable, and x3 is also a free variable. So now I'm going to write my solution in my parametric vector form. Now I have x3 as a variable, and x2 is a free variable. The only one I can really solve for is x1. That looks like it'll be a minus 4x2. Let's start with our coefficient here. This looks like it'll be 1 minus 4x2 plus 2x3. And once again, I'm just going to separate the different pieces. I'm looking at just the number values. I have 1, and I have a 0 and a 0. Plus the x2 coefficients, minus 4, 1, 0. And lastly, the x3 coefficients, which would be 2, 0, and 1. And so this right here would be my solution. I've already identified it as a plane. And one way maybe I can visualize that is I have some starting vector, my 1, 0, 0. I'm adding any multiple of some other vector. So that kind of generates that line we had earlier. But not only can I add any multiple of that, but I can add any multiple of some other vector. So if I had one of those vectors, and any multiple of the first, I would get this. If I add two of that vector, plus any multiple of the first, I get this. So you can see I'm really just generating a whole plane of values here. So once again, that helps support the idea that it's a plane in R3. Now let's take a look at page two. Problem 3 says, consider the following system of linear equations given below. And we're given this system. First, it says, write the augmented matrix for the system. So to write the augmented matrix, I'm just gathering up the coefficients of all my variables here. So along the first row, this looks like 1, 4, and 2. And I'm augmenting with the values on the right-hand side of my equation. So this would be 2. Second row is going to be 1, 2, 2, negative 4 then negative 2, negative 8, negative 4, and negative 4. So there's my augmented matrix. Part B says find the reduced row echelon form of this augmented matrix by hand. So once again, here is my augmented matrix. Now I need to row reduce this thing. All right, so what's my first row operation here? R2 minus R1. R1 stays the same. And now I take row 2 minus r1, so 1 minus 1 is 0, 2 minus 4 is negative 2, 2 minus 2 is 0, and negative 4 minus 2 is negative 6. 
I'm actually going to do a second row operation right away. I'm going to take R3 plus 2 times R1. Plus 2 times R1. So that will give me negative 2 plus 2 times this. Of course, that's why I chose that operation, to get a 0 in that position. Now I have negative 8 plus 2 times 4. That will also give me a 0. Negative 4 plus 2 times 2, also a 0. And negative 4 plus 2 times 2 is also a 0. All right. So now I have another more operation. So now I have some more row operations to do. The next row operation I'm going to do is I'm going to take R1 plus 2 times R2. So my last row is going to stay the same. And then I'm going to have R1. It's going to be R1 plus 2 times R2. R1 plus 2 times R2. R1 plus 2 times 0, and R1 plus 2 times negative 6. So that would be negative 10. I'll do another row operation as well. I'm going to take R2, and I'm going to multiply by a negative 1 half. I will get 0, 1, 0, and positive 3. All right, that looks like it's brought me to my reduced row echelon form. So what's next? Part C says write the solutions to the system in parametric vector form. So whereas in the last problem I already had them row reduced, this time I had to actually do the row reduction. But now that I'm at this row reduced state, I can see what my solutions are. If I look at the first equation here, the first row will give me x1 plus 2x3 equals negative 10. The second row tells me that x2 is equal to 3. And that's all the equations I have. The last row tells me that 0 equals 0. And what I can see here is that I don't have a pivot position in that third column. And that tells me that x3 is really just a free variable. So now if I want to see my solutions, my values for x1, x2, and x3, once again, I just said that x3 is a free variable. x2 is 3. And x1, I can solve that in terms of x3 to get negative 10 minus 2x3. And once again, we'll write this as my uh, standalone values here, negative 10, 3, and 0, plus x3 times the coefficients of the x3 values, negative 2, 0, and 1. So this would be my solution in parametric vector form. And then D says find the solution to the associated homogeneous system. So now, instead of looking at Ax equals B, we're going to use the same matrix A, but just solve AX equals 0. And it turns out we don't actually have to do any more work for this, because the row reduction will be the same. The only difference is that far right-hand column will be all zeros. And no matter what row operations we do, it will still be zeros. So how does that affect our final solution? Well, that last column is really just giving us these values in our solution. So without doing any more work, I can just directly take the, the associated solutions to the homogeneous system to be this set of vectors here. So what is the solution? It's just x3 times negative 2, 0, 1. Any number times that vector will be a solution to the associated homogeneous system. All right, on to page 3. <coughs> Problem 4 says we're going to determine whether these sets of vectors are linearly dependent or independent. So the first one, we're going to use some tricks here to kind of shortcut this instead of using just the definitions. In this first case, we have two vectors. And two vectors are linearly dependent if and only if they are multiples of each other. So I can see right away that they are not multiples of each other. Therefore, these ones are linearly independent because they are not multiples of each other. Then I have B here. I have three matrices, so I can't just use this multiple of one another trick because they could be any linear combination of each other to be linearly dependent. And so really, to work on this problem, I'm just going to take these vectors. I'm going to throw them into a matrix. And I'm going to do the row reduction on them. And all I need to do is get to row echelon form and look for my pivot positions. If these vectors are linearly independent, I should get a pivot position in each column. So that's what I'm going to do here. Looks like I will leave row 1 the same. 
and then I will swap row 3 and 2 to get 1, negative 3, 2, and 0, 0, negative 4. Then I'm going to take row 2 minus row 1 to get 0, 0, and 1. And then I'll divide the last row by negative 4 also to get 1. And then finally I'll take R3 minus R2 and I'll get that one. And so what I can see here is that I don't have a pivot position in my second column. Therefore, these vectors are not linearly independent. I do know that these two vectors are linearly independent. But actually, now in hindsight, I can look back at these vectors. And I really just see that the second vector is just negative 3 times that first vector. So that's the one that sticks out. And lastly, we'll go to C here. Now this one I can say right away without doing much work. So, so part B here was going to be linearly dependent because the second column vector was just a multiple of the first one. D here I can also just say it's linearly dependent. But this time I don't have to do any work because I can look at this third vector. I say that's the zero vector. And any set that contains a zero vector automatically has to be linearly dependent. All right, number five says we're talking about a transformation. The transformation takes these values and is outputting this result. So then part A says, as defined, T is a mapping from where to where. So what spaces? Well, it looks like I am inputting three numbers. I'm inputting an x1, an x2, and x3. Well, the set of all lists of three numbers is R3. So it looks like my inputs are vectors in R3. And the other question is, where are they being mapped to? Well, if I took any values for x1, x2, and 3, I plugged them in here, it looks like I would get x1 plus x3, so that's some number. And then I get x2 plus 3x3, some other number. And that would be it. So it looks like the output is a list of two numbers. Instead of all lists of two numbers, is R2. So it looks like this transformation is taking vectors from R3 and mapping them to vectors in R2. B says find a matrix that implements this mapping. So how do we do that? Well, it turns out that matrix that we're looking for, we can get to just by just by taking the transformation of the standard basis vectors. And if I look at the transformation acting on my standard basis, the result of this should be the matrix I'm looking for. So this first basis vector is just going to be the basis vector 1, 0, 0. And what happens if I apply the transformation of that one? Well, that has 1 for x1 and 0 for the other values. So it looks like the result will just be 1 and 0. So that's my first column. Now I'll say, what about transformation of the second standard basis vector, which looks like 0, 1, 0? Well, here I have 0 for every value except for x2. So when I plug that in, I would get 0. And I will get 1 plus 3 times 0. And lastly, E3 here, which is 0, 0, 1. If I apply the transformation of that, here I'll get the vector 1 and 3. <clears throat> so this is the matrix that implements that transformation. And then C says, is the transformation 1 to 1 onto both or neither? And so to answer these questions about the transformation, I can actually do some analysis on the matrix A. I can say if the columns of that matrix A are linearly dependent, then the transformation is 1 to 1. So I look and I see that I have pivot positions in my first two columns, but I do not have a pivot position in my last column. Therefore, that last column vector must just be a linear combination of the other two. So the columns are not linearly dependent. Therefore, the transformation must not be 1 to 1. What about onto? For a transformation to be onto, I just need a pivot position in every row. And I do have a pivot position in every row. So it looks like this transformation is onto. And lastly, it says, does there exist an inverse transformation to map back once I've mapped to? In this case, I can say no. And the reason is, is because for this inverse transformation to exist, my transformation would have to be both 1 to 1 and onto. And in part C, I showed that it was just onto, but not 1 to 1. Therefore, there can't exist an inverse to this transformation. 
All right, let's look at the next page. Here we have problem six. So in this problem, I need to calculate A inverse by hand showing all work. So the way I calculate inverse is I create a matrix where I put A on the left-hand side and I augment it with identity of the proper size. So in this case, I would have the matrix A augmented with this identity matrix. And if this matrix is invertible, I should be able to do row operations and the final result should have identity in the first side and the result on the right hand side of this augmented matrix will be A inverse. So let's see if I can get there. The first row operation I'm going to do here is I'm going to take R two minus R one. R1 will stay the same. And I'll take R2 minus R1. I will get 0 here, 1 here, 0 here, negative 1, 1, and 0. And I'll just write in my third row. In fact, I'll take that third row of my next row operation, just divide it by 2. That'll give me a value of 1 here and 1 half on the end. So that was one half of R3. Now my next row operation looks like it's going to be R1 minus R3. R3 will stay the same. R2 will stay the same. But R1 will be 1 minus 0, 2 minus 0, 1 minus 1 is 0. And it'll be 1 minus 0 is 1, 0 minus 0 is 0, and 0 minus a half is negative 1 half. And my last row operation is going to be R1 minus 2 times R2. So R3 will stay the same. R2 will stay the same. R1 minus 2 times R2 will give me a 1 here a 0 here, a 0 here. I'll have 1 minus 2 times negative 1. That'll give me positive 3. 0 minus 2 times 1. And negative 1 half minus 0. So I'll get a minus 1 half here. And now I see that I do have identity on the left-hand side. And that tells me my inverse matrix should be the matrix 3, negative 2, negative 1 half, negative 1, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 2. And that should be my inverse of A. Oh, except I have one little mistake here. This last piece should be 1 half down here. I just didn't carry that correctly from over here. All right, so there's my inverse matrix. Now what I'm supposed to do with this inverse, I'm supposed to use my inverse to solve this matrix equation. And how do I do that? Well, if I have AX equals B, and I multiply on the left on both sides by A inverse. Then over here, A inverse times A is just identity. Over here, I have whatever that product is. Identity times X is just X. So my solution is just A inverse times B. So all I'm going to do is take my A inverse and multiply it by that vector B, 1, 1, 1. When I multiply this matrix by 1, 1, 1, the effect is basically like adding up all the different components of each row. So my result will be 3 minus 2 plus negative 1 half. I'll be positive 1 half. Then I'll have a 0 here and 1 half in the end. And so this is my x vector that's my solution right there. Now part C says calculate the determinant of A. So I have my matrix A, and now I want to calculate the determinant of A. So here is my determinant. Notice that when I write the determinant, I use these straight edges, not the matrix that have the little hook right there. And so how do I calculate this determinant? I want to expand on one of the rows or columns. In this case, I want to expand on the third row because I have a couple zeros in it. So I just need to choose the appropriate sign for each of these component values, and then take that sign and that value times some subdeterminant. 
So if I just look at my signs here, I'll do some alternating signs. And so this will be plus zero times some submatrix, but I really don't care what this is because it's a leading coefficient of zero. Then I have minus zero times some other little subdeterminant. And lastly, plus two times some subdeterminant. I don't care about these first ones because they just are zero. But this last one is two times some subdeterminant. It's the determinant of the matrix I would have left if I eliminated the column and row that that two is in. So I'm left with just this little matrix. And I want two times that determinant. So this will be two times this product minus this product. Three minus two is one. Looks like my result is just two. Now I should calculate the determinant of the inverse. But in this case, I really don't have to because I know that the determinant of A inverse is just equal to one over the determinant of A. It looks like in this case, that's just one half. So that would be the determinant of A inverse. All right, that finishes up this page. Let's take a look at the next page. <clears throat> so now we're gonna get to our true and false. So the first question says a basis for R3 must contain exactly three vectors. This one is true. If we only had two vectors, so for instance, if we had two vectors, one, two, three, and one, 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 for instance, if I did this row reduction, there's no possible way I could have a pivot position in every row. Similarly, if I had more than three vectors, there's no way I could have a pivot position in every single column. So I have to have exactly three vectors to be a basis for R3. B says if B is a linear combination of A1 and A2, then the augmented matrix has a solution. That's absolutely true. In this case, to be a linear combination of these two vectors, it means there is some number, x1 times that first vector, plus some number times that second vector that must lead me to B. That's what it means to be a linear combination of these two vectors. But that's just a vector equation, which can be rewritten as a matrix equation. Sorry, that should be A2. And to solve that in matrix equation, I would create the augmented matrix and then try to find the solution. C says elementary row operations on an augmented matrix cannot change the solution set of the associated linear system. This one is also true. And this is the reason we do our row operations, because we can transform our system of equations into an easier system, but we are not changing the solution set. D says, if there is a pivot position for every row of an m by n matrix A, then the transformation, t of x equals ax, is one to one. So sometimes this can get a little confusing of which piece is which, so let's actually draw a little picture. This is an m by n matrix, so I have m rows and I have n columns, so that's how I'm gonna draw my matrix here. It says if there's a pivot position for every row, for every row. So I might have one and a pivot position here and a pivot position here and some other stuff here. And so here's an example where I have a pivot position for every row, but I don't have a pivot, pivot position for every column. And it's the columns I need to make sure these vectors are linearly independent, which would tell me the transformation is one to one. So this would be false because I don't need a pivot position for every row, but I do need one for every column to say the transformation is one to one. E says if the transformation mapping x to 8x is one to one and onto, A is invertible. This one is true. If the transformation is one to one and onto, then the matrix that represents the transformation is invertible. F says a system with free variables is consistent and has infinitely many solutions. We know that if a system is consistent and has free variables, then it has infinite many solutions, but that's not what this question is saying. I can find a system with free variables that is not consistent with infinite many solutions. I simply have to find a system, for instance, like this. This is my augmented matrix. And in this case, I have two free variables. I have x2 and x3 will both be free. But the second equation is telling me that 0 equals 2, which makes the system inconsistent. So this is false. G says an n by n matrix A is invertible if and only if the determinant is equal to 0. 
To help us remember this, we can think about that two by two case. If I have a matrix A, A, B, C, D, just a nice little two by two, then for that two by two, I have a formula for my inverse. It's one over the determinant of A times D, negative B, negative C, and A. I don't really care about that matrix so much, but I do care about this coefficient that I'm multiplying that matrix by, one over the determinant of A. If the determinant of A is zero, then that expression is undefined and there is no inverse. So it's not invertible if that determinant is equal to zero. So this one is gonna be false. Next one says an n by n matrix is diagonalizable if and only if A has n distinct eigenvectors. And this is true. If we have the right number of eigenvectors to form our matrix P that's invertible, then we will be able to diagonalize that matrix. I says if the null space of A is just the zero vector, then A is not invertible. So let's think about this one. The null space of A is a set of all solutions to the homogeneous equation. So if I only have one solution, if the only solution is the trivial solution, then the matrix is invertible, because then I'd be able to take A inverse of both sides, and I would get A inverse times the zero vector, which is zero. And that would be the only solution. So in this case, this, if the null space is just the zero vector, then A is invertible. So is not would be a false statement. J, every linearly independent set in R3 is an orthogonal set. This one is false. I can have many different bases for R3, that would be linearly independent, but it wouldn't necessarily be orthogonal. If A is an n by n matrix, and zero is an eigenvalue of A, then the matrix is invertible. So let's look at the eigenvalue equation. AX equals lambda X. It says the effect of the matrix on the eigenvector is just a scaling of that eigenvector. But if zero is an eigenvalue, this value is zero, then my equation, simplifies to AX equals zero. If this matrix is vertible, then the only eigenvector would be zero, and zero cannot be an eigenvector. We're looking for non-zero solutions to this equation, and they don't exist if both lambda equals zero and A is invertible. So if zero is an eigenvalue, then the matrix cannot be invertible. So this one is also false here. And the last one. If the vectors in an orthogonal set are normalized, the new vectors will be orthogonal. And that one is true. So basically that tells me if I have two vectors that are perpendicular, if they're orthogonal, say V1 is orthogonal to V2, then we know that V1 dot V2 would be equal to zero. But what happens if I took some multiple, if I normalize one of the vectors? Well, that's just dividing or multiplying by some value. So if I looked at what two times v1 dot v2 would be. Well, that's just the same thing as 2 times v1 dot v2. But if they're orthogonal and that's 0, this would be 2 times 0, which is still 0. So scaling these vectors don't change the fact that they're orthogonal. Now this next section is going to be a fill in the blank. So we're going to go through some semi-definitions and just fill in the missing words. So most of these are going to be just the definitions of each of the items. So there won't be much explain, explanation, just going back to those definitions. So A says a linearly independent set that spans a base is called A, and this is a basis for the space. B, the set of all solutions to the homogeneous equation, AX equals zero, is called the null space of a matrix A. C, the set of all linear combinations of the columns of the matrix A is called the column space of A. D says a vector that has a length of one is called a unit vector. E, a number lambda is an eigenvalue of A if and only if the equation AX equals lambda X has non-trivial solutions. Now another way to express the same equation would be a minus lambda i times x equals the zero vector. And this would be another way to kind of say that same thing. If we did a little bit of algebra on that first equation, we could generate the second equation. 
F says if A is an orthogonal matrix, an orthogonal matrix, then A transpose is equal to what? In that case, A transpose is equal to A inverse, inverse of the matrix A. G says if I have two vectors, U and V, then U minus the projection of U onto V is what to V? In this case, it would be orthogonal. And the best way to recall this one is with the picture. I have two vectors. I have U and V. And I'm looking for the, I have the projection of U onto my vector V. That's this piece. That's the projection. The projection of U onto V. And this says U minus the projection. Well, that's this vector right here. That right there is U minus the projection of U onto V. And we can see that is perpendicular to V. It's orthogonal to V. If A equals Q times R, where this is the QR factorization of A, so Q has orthonormal columns, then R is equal to what? In this case, it would be Q transpose times A. And why? Well, if Q has orthonormal columns, that means it's an orthogonal matrix. And as we saw earlier, then Q transpose would equal Q inverse. So if I have this equation A equals Q times R, I can multiply both sides by Q transpose. But on the right-hand side, this will be identity times R. Identity times the matrix is just the matrix. So I'm left with this easy way to calculate what that value of R is. <coughs> All right, let's take a look at number nine. This problem says let the following set of vectors, and they gave me two vectors in B, be a basis for a vector space V. Answer the following questions. A says, what is the dimension of V? This one is two because the dimension of a space is the number of vectors in its basis. Here's a basis, two vectors, therefore the dimension is two. P says, what are the B coordinates of X, i.e., and they write it like this. If this is the standard coordinates for X, what is the B coordinates of X? So what this is saying is, what is the weightings of the basis vectors that get me to this vector 3, 2? In other words, what is number of the first basis vector plus what number of the second basis vector are going to get me to this vector that I want, 3, 2, 0. But if I write that out, I can see it's just a vector equation, which is the same as a matrix equation. And to solve this, to find the C1 and C2, which the C1 and the C2, these are the coordinates, all I have to do is create an augmented matrix. 1, 1, 0, 1, 2, 0, augmented with 3, 2, 0. I'll do row operations to find the solution to this system. Specifically, I'm going to take R2 minus R1. This will give me 0, 1, and R2 minus R1 would be negative 1 here. And then I have 0, 0, 0 for my last row. Then I'll take R1 minus R2. R2 will stay the same in this case, and R1 will be 1, 0, and then I have 3 minus negative 1, so that would be 4. Oops, and there should be a 1 here. So it looks like my C1 value is 4, and my C2 value is negative 1. And so the coordinates to my vector x in terms of the B basis is going to be the coordinates 4, negative 1. Problem 10 says, given this matrix, and here's our matrix, which row reduces to this, so here we've given the row reduction so we don't have to actually go through those steps, it says answer the following questions. What is the null space? It says the null space is a subspace of R what? So if we think of what the null space is, instead of all solutions to the homogeneous equation, it's all the x's that I can plug in here to make this a true statement. Well, if I take this matrix and I want to multiply by some x, to see if it's in the null space, what's the size of this vector? Well, the number of rows in my x vector I have to match the number of columns in A. So it has to be a vector in R4. Then it says find a basis for the null space of A. Well, is all the solutions. And to find those solutions, I would take this matrix and row reduce it. I would augment it with 0 and row reduce it. But that right-hand side, since it would be all zeros, it wouldn't change at all during that row reduction. So essentially, I would just be looking at the row reduced version of A and then rewriting that in parametric vector form. 
So if I take that row roots version and write out the equations, I would get x1 plus 2x2 plus x4. My second equation would be x3 plus x4. Both of these are equal to 0. And my third row is just giving me 0 equals 0, so it's not really giving me new information. And what I can see is that column 2 and column 4 both don't have pivot positions, so these but mo both must be free variables. So what does my solution look like? Well, x1 is equal to minus 2x2 minus x4. x2 is a free variable. x3 is equal to minus x4, and x4 is a free variable. So my solutions look like any multiple of negative 2, 1, 0, 0 plus any multiple of negative 1, 0, 1, 1, which means these two vectors are the basis for my null space. C says, what is the dimension of the null space? Well, once again, the dimension is just the number of vectors in this basis. In this case, that would be 2. D says, the column space of A is a subspace of R what? Well, the column space is a set of all linear combinations of the columns of A. Well, if I take linear combinations of the columns, it's really just like writing out the results of that matrix multiplication. Because one way I can do that multiplication is to think of the linear combination of the columns of A. So what's in the column space? It's all these vectors B, all the possible outputs that I get when I do this multiplication. So all the outputs, if this is a, if I go back up here and put in my x values, and take a linear combination of these columns, I'm just going to be adding up these different columns. And if I add up a bunch of vectors in R3, the result is going to be a vector in R3. So in this case, it's a subspace of R3. This says find a basis for the column space. We might think that if we're just taking linear combinations of the columns, then all the columns should be the basis. While well, the columns will certainly span the space because they are creating the space, however, to be a basis, not only do they have to span the space, but they also have to be linearly independent. So I'm going to look up here and see which of these columns are linearly independent. And that will tell me which ones form a basis for the column space. Now, to find out which vectors are linearly independent, I look at the row reduced form. I see that I have pivot positions here and here in the first and third columns. That tells me that the first and third columns of my original matrix, those are linearly independent. So a basis for the column space would be 1, 2, negative 1, and 2, 5, 3. And that would be a basis for my column space. Next question with the dimension of the column space. Once again, this is the number of vectors in the basis. In this case, it will be 2. Let's look at the next page. <coughs> Problem number 11, we're supposed to find the determinant of the following matrices. And there'll be some tricks that will help us along our way for, for these matrices as well. For instance, the first one is an upper triangular matrix. So in this case, we know that the determinant of the matrix is just the product of the diagonal entries. So in this case, the determinant will just be 2 times 3 times negative 4 times 1. So it should be 6 times 4 is negative 24. That's our determinant value. The next one, we're going to have to do a little bit longer way. We're going to have to expand on one of the rows or columns. But in this case, because we see this middle row has a couple of zeros, we want to expand down that middle row. So all we have to do is set our signs and then go through our row expansion. In this case, we have plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. So we'll have negative 0 times some stuff, plus 3 times some stuff, and minus 0 times some stuff. But since 0 times anything is 0, I don't really care about these first and last terms. I just care about this middle one. And so 3 times what stuff? Well, it's the determinant of the matrix I get after I eliminate the row and column that the 3 is in. So I'm left with a 2, 1, 1, and 5. 2, 1, 1, and 5. So the determinant of this big matrix is 3 times the determinant of this little matrix, which is just 10 minus 1. So it looks like I have 9 and times 3 is 27. So it looks like that value is 27. <coughs> Problem number 12 has us find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for the following matrices, and we have a couple of problems here. 
So to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors, first we find the eigenvalues. So in general, we're trying to find lambda and x to satisfy this equation. And I do a little bit of algebra to simplify this to this form, another form of this equation. But I don't like solving this equation because I have two variables in here. I might know what a and i are, but I don't know what lambda and x are. And I can't solve and find both of these values at once. So instead I look at this equation and say I'm looking for non-trivial solutions. So I'm looking for x's that aren't equal to zero. Well that tells me that this matrix, whatever it is, must not be invertible. Because if it was invertible, I could multiply both sides by the inverse, and that would just leave x equals zero. So if it's not invertible, that means the determinant of it must be equal to zero. So this is the equation I'm going to start off with. I'm going to use that equation to solve for lambda, and then feed it back into this equation and solve for x to find my eigenvectors. So we start with the a minus lambda i. In that case, here's my a, and subtracting lambda times the identity matrix, the effect is essentially just subtracting lambda off of those diagonals. So I'm finding this determinant. I'm going to set it equal to 0 and find out what lambda give me a determinant of 0. So to do this determinant, I take 1 minus lambda times 4 minus lambda minus the other diagonal product, which is 4. Then I'm going to expand out these two terms. I will get 4 minus 4 lambda minus 1 lambda is minus 5 lambda plus lambda squared, and then I have my minus 4. So these 4s will cancel out. Looks like I have lambda is squared minus 5 lambda. And the question is, when is this equal to 0? Well, since I can factor out a lambda to get this, it looks like it is 0 when lambda equals 0 or lambda equals 5. So those should be my two eigenvalues. Now, so that's finishing up this part. Now I use both of those values in this equation to solve for my eigenvectors. So now I say when lambda equals 0, what's the associated eigenvector? Well, when I plug this in, I'm essentially just solving a homogeneous equation. I'm solving the equation that looks like, well, a minus 5 times, or a minus 0 times i. So that would be 1, 2, 2, and 4 when I plug in lambda equals 0. And I could augment this with 0, but it really doesn't matter because as I do row operations, that right-hand side will just stay the same. And in fact, because I know there have to be non-trivial solutions here, that means that there have to be free variables. And since there's only two rows, I know one of these must be a multiple of the other. And so I should row reduce in this case and get row 2 minus 2 times row 1. And that will just leave me with a row of all zeros. Now the equation this gets me is x1 plus 2x2 equals 0. Essentially, I'm just writing out my solutions in parametric form now. I see that x2 is just a free variable. And my solutions should then be well, x1 is equal to negative 2x2, and x2 is just free. So it looks like my solutions are any multiple of the vector negative 2, 1. That vector negative 2, 1 is my eigenvector. And I do the same thing with lambda equals 5. When I plug that one into my a minus lambda i piece, to this piece essentially, I will get the matrix 1 minus 5 is negative 4, 2, 2, and 4 minus 5 is negative 1. Once again, I can augment, but actually I don't even need to. I just need to understand that it's still there, because that row reduction will not change that value. And now I can go ahead and row reduce this if I want. I'll divide through the first row by negative 4. I'll get 1, negative 1 half, and then I have 2 and negative 1. And then I'm going to take r2 minus 2 times r1, I'll get a row of zeros. Now really, I don't even have to do that step. Once I understand that I'm finding eigenvectors, and if I just have a little 2 by 2, I know they're going to be multiple, multiples of each other. And I really could just grab either one of the first rows and just write out the, the equation to start off with. At this point now, we have x1 minus 1 half x2 is equal to 0. So once again, I'm writing out my solutions. x1 is just equal to 1 half x2. And x2 is just free. So it looks like my solutions are any multiple of 1 half and 1. But actually, even though that's a perfectly valid eigenvector, it's really not the one I want to use. Because if I know my solutions are any multiple of this vector, why don't I take a better multiple that will at least clear the, fr the fractions? So for instance, if I multiply this whole thing by 
2, I would get the eigenvector 1, 2. And I'd rather work with that one. So that'll be my second eigenvector. So it looks like I have the eigenpair, 1 lambda equals 0. My associate eigenvector would be negative 2, 1. And 1 lambda equals 5, my second eigenvector would be the vector 1, 2. Those are my eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Now we'll look at the second one, b. Once again, I'm going to start with the determinant here of a minus lambda i. So in this case, it'll be 4 minus lambda, negative 13, 1, and 0 minus lambda. And it looks like I will get 4 minus lambda times a negative lambda minus 1 times negative 13, so that ends up to be plus 13. So, it looks like I get positive lambda squared minus 4 lambda plus 13. And the question is, when is this equal to 0? This one looks a little tricky. I don't know if I'm going to be able to actually factor this one to really find those nice roots. So instead, I'm going to have to use the quadratic formula. I will use lambda equals, looks like a negative b, so that negative negative 4 turns into 4, plus or minus the square root of b squared, minus 4 times a times c. So 4 times 13 should give me a value of 52, all over 2 times a. So if I do this first piece of the fraction, I get 2, plus or minus. Then inside these parentheses, I get 16 minus 52. Well, that's 36. So it looks like I have the square root of negative 36 over 2. 2 plus or minus. Well, the square root of 36 is just 6. And the square root of negative 1 is i. So it looks like I should get 6i divided by 2, or plus or minus 3i. So here, in this case, it looks like I have complex eigenvalues. So the nice thing about this is I really find them both at once. They always come in conjugate pairs. So I have 2 plus 3i is one lambda value, and 2 minus 3i is the other lambda value. So now, just as before, I'm going to plug these in to find my eigenvectors. In this case, I'm going to say when lambda equals 2 minus 3i, and I just plug this back into a minus lambda i, and I solve that homogeneous system. In this case, it would be 4 minus lambda. So I'm going to actually write it out this time. 4 minus my 2 minus 3i negative 13, 1, and minus 2 minus 3i. And if I want, I could augment those with 0. And the reason I'm writing them out is I want to make sure I remember to distribute my negative sign. Now, row reduction here might be a little tedious because I have to work with these imaginary values. But once again, I don't have to because I know if there exists non-zero eigenvectors, these two rows must be multiples of each other. So I'm actually just going to grab that second row absolutely arbitrarily. I could have grabbed the first one. I'm just going to choose to grab the second one because I have a nice coefficient of 1 in one of the positions. That equation will give me x1 minus the quantity 2 minus 3i times x2 is equal to 0. So in this case, it looks like my solution is going to be, well, x1 could be equal to, if I add this term to the other side, 2 minus 3i times x2, and x2 is just free. So it looks like my eigenvector is going to be any multiple of 2 minus 3i and 1. So that is my eigenvector. Now, there's lots of different ways I can write that final expression, different ways I can represent this eigenvector. We will go through one extra little piece here. If my eigenvector is 2 minus 3i and 1, a lot of times I like to separate the real and imaginary parts of my vector. So I can actually rewrite this vector as the real parts plus i times the imaginary parts. So that's another way I can express this eigenvector. All right, let's take a look at number 13. Let a equal this matrix with eigenvalues 2 and 4 and corresponding eigenvectors 1, 2, and 1, 4. So they've done the work of finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors here. And they're asking us in part a to write the diagonalization of a. So we have to find p and d and p inverse. So in this case, p is just a matrix whose columns are the eigenvectors. And d is just a matrix that's diagonal 
and the diagonal entries are the associated eigenvalues. So my first eigenvector is 1, 2, therefore I have to put the eigenvalue in that position, that first position as well. So that would be P and D, and we can just go ahead and calculate P inverse if we needed to finish the diagonalization. Part B says use this information from the previous part to write an expression for a to the fourth. And the important thing to note here is that a to the fourth is just a times a times a times a. And if a is equal to p times d times p inverse, then we could really replace all of those a's by what they are equal to. But the nice thing is that we can see that all of these inside products of p inverse and p those are just going to end up with identity, and identity times any matrix is just that matrix. So the result is going to be p times d to the fourth p inverse. Now it might not look like we made any progress, but the nice thing about taking the power of a diagonal matrix is the result is really just the powers on the diagonal entries. So a to the fourth is really going to be our matrix p times d, except with those values raised to the fourth power. And then, of course, times p inverse if we wanted to calculate it. 14 says find the distance between these two vectors. Well, the distance between two vectors is the magnitude of y minus x. So in this case, we have the magnitude of, we'll take the difference here. So I will take the difference of those two vectors and get 6 minus 2 is 4, and 1 minus 4 is negative 3. And we're taking the magnitude of this vector. The max is going to be the square root of 4 squared plus negative 3 squared, which is 9. So that's 16 plus 9 is 25, and root 25 is 5. So the distance between these two vectors is 5. Let's check out the next page now. 15 says, given the vectors below, answer the following questions. We're given a u and v. It starts out and says, what is the unit vector in the direction of v? So here is v, and the unit vector in the direction of v is just v divided by its length. So the magnitude of v is going to be the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared, or root 2. So this unit vector is going to be 1 over root 2 times my vector v. I could leave it like that if I want. What is u dot v? Well, that dot product, I'm just going to take that product, 2 times 1, plus this product, 1 times 1. Looks like the dot product is equal to 3. C says, what is the projection of u onto v? So this is the projection of u onto v, which we sometimes write as u hat. And it's going to be u dot v divided by v dot v times the vector v. We just saw that u dot v is equal to 3. v dot v is going to be the magnitude of v squared, or just 2. And then I have my vector v, which is just 1 and 1. So it looks like I have the vector that is 3 halves, 3 halves. Part d says express u as the sum of a vector in the span of v and a vector orthogonal to the span of v. So what does this mean? Well, if we have a vector v and a vector u, and I project u down onto v to find this thing, u hat, then I can rewrite u as u hat plus some other vector. To get this vector, I really take u minus u hat. So if I take my vector, u minus the projection, I'll get this orthogonal vector that I can represent u with. So I have a vector u. My vector u is the vector 2, 1. And I already have the projection. So if I look at u minus u hat, that would be 2, 1 minus 3 halves, 3 halves. And the result will be negative 1 half, positive 1 half, and negative 1 half. And so then I can take u and represent it as the sum of the projection. That's 3 halves and 3 halves plus this vector that I just calculated, 1 half and negative 1 half. And the interesting thing here is not only is that some of these two vectors equal to u, but also these two vectors are orthogonal. If I take their dot product, it really will get equal to 0. And on the next page, let's take a look at 16 and find the Gram-Schmidt process to find an orthonormal basis. 
All right, so I have u1 and u2. So basically, I have some vector u1 and some vector u2. And I want to find an orthogonal basis for the same span. So I want to find a v1 and a v2 that span the same space, but are orthogonal. So the first step is to let v1 equal u1. That's the easy piece. Next, I need to find this vector. So v2 is going to be u2 minus the projection of u2 onto v1. So I just calculate these pieces. u2 is just the vector u2. And the projection of u2 onto v1 is u2 dotted with v1 divided by v1 dotted with v1 times the vector v1. Well, u2 dot v1, since u1 is equal to v1, I can just take this dot product. I will get 12 plus 0 plus 88 all over v1 dot v1, which is 36 plus 64, times the vector v1, which is 6, 0, 8. So this piece is really just this piece. So now, once again, I'm computing u minus all this stuff. 88 plus 12 is 100, and 36 plus 64 is 100. So when I divide those two, I will get a value of 1. So it's really just 2, 0, 11 minus 6, 0, 8. And the result is going to be negative 4, 0, and 3. This should be my v2 vector. Now, as a quick check, I should be able to take v1 dot v2 and get equal to 0. So if I take v1 dot v2, if I take 6, 0, 8 dotted with negative 4, 0, 3, do I get 0? Well, I get negative 24 plus 24. That is equal to 0. So they are orthogonal. So I really do have v1 and v2 now. Now, 17 says let a be. Now one more thing about 16 is I, I did find an orthogonal basis, but I didn't find an orthonormal basis. So the last step to finding an orthonormal basis would be to normalize both of these vectors. So I can find the magnitude of v1 to be the square root of 6 squared plus 0 squared plus 8 squared, or 36 plus 64. We already found that value to be 100, so the square root of 100 is 10. So it looks like my first vector, my orthonormal basis, would be 1 tenth of 6, 0, 8. So that is my first orthonormal vector. My next orthonormal vector would be to take my second vector, v2, and divide by its length. Well, what is the length of v2? It's the square root of 16 plus 0 plus 3 squared, which is 9. Well, that looks like 16 plus 9 is 25. The square root of 25 is just 5. So it looks like my second orthonormal vector would be 1 fifth, the vector in negative 4, 0, 3. And this is my orthonormal basis. Not just orthogonal, but orthonormal. Now 17 says, let A be the matrix whose columns are the vectors from that previous problem. So this was our u1 and u2. And they want us to find a QR factorization of A. Well, the first step in finding the QR factorization is to use Gram-Schmidt to find an orthonormal basis for the column space. And essentially, I've already done that. And those orthonormal basis vectors are what I use to form Q. So I can just say at this point that Q is 6 tenths. 0 and 8 tenths is my first column, and negative 4 fifths, 0 and 3 fifths as my second column. In fact, I could even simplify a couple of those pieces. This, for instance, would be 3 fifths, and this, for instance, would be 4 fifths. And I can also really quickly see them, they are orthogonal. So that's Q. Now, what do I do about, about R? Well, recall that if A is equal to Q times R, and recall that if Q has columns who are orthonormal vectors, then it's an orthogonal matrix, and Q transpose is actually equal to Q inverse. So I know what A is, and I've already generated Q. I just have to find R. I can solve this for R very quickly by multiplying both sides by the transpose. And because Q transpose is the same thing as Q inverse, this piece is just identity. I get Q transpose times A is equal to R. And so this is the piece I need to calculate. 
Q transpose is just 3 fifths, 0, 4 fifths, and negative 4 fifths, 0, and 3 fifths. I'm taking that times my matrix A. And it looks like the result should be, in the first case, I would get 18 fifths plus 32 fifths. And then the second row, I get negative 24 fifths plus 24 fifths. My second column is going to look like 6 fifths plus 44 fifths. And down at the bottom, I get negative 8 fifths plus 33 fifths. Looks ugly for the moment, but it simplifies rather nicely. If I take the first piece, I have 18 plus 32, that should be 50. Divided by 5 is just the value 10. Negative 24 plus 24 is 0, which is good because I want R to be an upper triangular matrix. So I'm glad this value is 0. Up here, I get 6 plus 44, which is also 50. Divided by 10 is divided by 5 is 10. And down here, when I take 33 and I subtract 8, I will get 25. 25 divided by 5 is just 5. So this looks to be my R. And so the QR factorization, A should be equal to 3 fifths, 0, 4 fifths, negative 4 fifths, 0, and 3 fifths. That's Q, and this is R. And if I had more time on an exam, I would want to take that product and just make sure that it really does get me the A and to make sure I haven't made any algebraic mistakes here. All right, and that concludes this practice final exam. Thank you.